Hi, today on the Laura Flanders Show, Dr. Cornell West considers everything from Black Lives Matter to the death of blues master B.B. King. Welcome to our program. What does it mean to be a public intellectual in today's modern world? Our next guest has received both the plaudits and the attacks that come with the job. He's been an outspoken supporter of many causes others won't touch and an equally outspoken critic of President Barack Obama. He was the civil rights elder most warmly embraced by people activists on the ground in Ferguson and Baltimore. He's less popular on MSNBC. Cornell West has written or edited dozens of books, including classics like Race Matters and Democracy Matters. His most recent is Black Prophetic Fire, written in conversation with Krista Buschendorf. He's collaborated with musicians from Prince to Jill Scott, KRS-One, and appeared in 25 films, including the entire Matrix trilogy. All of that is nothing like having you here in the flesh, mm. Cornell. Great to have you. Thanks for coming in, Professor I'm blessed to be West. here. And I want to salute you, my dear sister Laura. What a force for good you are. I take it to the heart. So what a trajectory. When I went back, just to remind myself of some of the facts of your life, born in Tulsa, went to Harvard, first African-American to get a PhD from Princeton in 1980, to today at the Union mm. Theological Seminary, it's an extraordinary span. How do you kind of trace the course of, of your life, and what does it say about America? Well, first, I think I've lived a blessed life. I think the highest honor I've ever had is to be the second son of Irene and Clifton and to be the brother of, of Clifton, Cynthia, and Cheryl, and the father of Zaytun and Clifton. Uh, I was fundamentally shaped black family, black community, Shiloh Baptist Church, black church, Black Panther Party right next door, never a member, but very much involved in the activities from Freedom feeding the children to uh, visiting the prisons and so forth. So that was really the two pillars, the family commune on the one hand with the music mm -hmm. and then the uh, church on the other. So by the time I went to Harvard, Yale and Princeton, they were wonderful supplements to, to help me provide certain kind of uh, analytical tools and broaden my vision and so on. But it's fundamentally about just trying to tell the truth as it relates to the plight of poor and working people here and around the world. But that combination of the the radicalism of, of Malcolm X or the Black Panthers, and well, you've spoken about your admiration for the theologian James Cone. That Absolutely. combination, how'd you characterize it? Is it liberation theology, something different? I think it's just a human thing. You're just trying to love your neighbor and trying to be honest about structures of domination so that you try to ensure that you touch people's lives such that they can be as free as they can in the short time that you're here. And I learned that very much in family and church. It's just that once I got exposed to, you know, Marxist analysis of capitalism, feminist analysis of patriarchy, anti-homophobic analysis of the losing side of the humanity of gay brothers and lesbian sisters and trans and cis folk. And most importantly for me, uh, coming to terms with legacy of white supremacy. I mean, empire as well mm -hmm. with imperialism and what have you, but really uh, wrestling with the legacy of white supremacy and trying to ensure that you live a life of self-respect and some self-determination. Do you remember when all those pieces kind of fell into place. I remember for me realizing, oh, white supremacy is a positive, I mean, is a is a active force, right, not right, just right. kind of backdrop. Do you remember that moment? It was probably when I was uh, about nine years old, I refused to salute the flag because my uncle had been lynched and they wrapped his body in the U.S. flag as it hung from the tree. Mm. All of a sudden I said, oh, it's not just evil in the world, but this is touching home. This is a personal and intimate thing. And I had a name for it, racism. No, Malcolm said white supremacy, that cuts deeper. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. But it's just one evil among others, you know, imperialism and anti-Jewish hatred, anti-Muslim hatred, anti-Arab hatred, anti-white hatred. They're all forms of evil. Mm -hmm. It's just a wrestling with evil in the world and what you're going to do about it. Evil and structures. Oh, Lord, yes. And all white supremacy is a structure as well as a, as, as a prejudice. It works on the individual level and it works on the structural institutional level. You are absolutely uh, right. Have you been as excited as I have to see movements like the Black Lives Matter movement oh, yeah. in Baltimore and Ferguson really taking that structural analysis and bringing it to the streets? You went to Ferguson along with a lot of elders and talking to people there, we've had a lot of the, the, Bolt, the, of the Ferguson activists on the program from Black Lives Matter uh, and others, they've said not all the elders were as welcome as you were, but you mm. Mm. were 
Brother West, Professor mm -hmm. Cornell, you were embraced. Well, what sure. did you do different? Well, no, I, you got to go in just like a jazz musician trying to learn something from the younger generation. You know you have a certain genuine humility and a certain willingness to learn and listen and to stand alongside. Now, whatever advice or insight they think I can bring, I try to give it. But to stand alongside, you know, these old messianic models of leadership, usually deeply patriarchal. It's H and I C, the head Negro in charge, the Pied Piper, that everybody's following. That Those days are to over. All with patriarchal <laughs> to the core, to the core. Now, Ella Baker, her legacy is a democratic leadership, it's collective leadership, it's grassroots indigenous leadership. So, what does that mean in concrete terms? You're there, you're on the streets, the cameras are rolling, you're the person that can get a lot of attention. What do you do? do to implement, to be an Ella Baker type of a, an elder rather than... Well, when it comes to corporate media, unlike, thank God, the truth telling that goes on in the, on, your, in your, on your TV show, that I say I refuse to do interviews unless I have a young person alongside me. So come on, Sister Ashley, come on, Brother Tory, Brother Teff. So that in that sense, then the cameras hit, and they ask me a question, I just ricochet let them respond. Why? Because they, the world needs to hear their voices. Uh, the black anthem is lift to every voice. And we need to hear the voices of young people because the black freedom movement is not going to remain alive if it's not transmitted and bequeathed to the younger generation. They pick it up, same courage, same vision, same willingness to suffer, same willingness to live and die. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that tradition stays alive. You had a conversation a few years ago at the New York Public Library with Jay-Z, the rapper. Yeah. And um, one of the things that came out of that that stuck with me was your reflection, or maybe it was his, on singing in harmony, whispers, you name it, right. versus right. the rapping tradition of being the front man. Um, one of you suggested that it creates some different models for leadership. Can you explain? Well, I just think that uh, you got the oligarchs who run the radio, video, live performance uh, uh, industries. They don't want groups like the Dramatics, the Delphonics, the Whispers, Jones Girls, Emotions, the Marvelettes, or the Temptations. They want single ego, often egoistic males out there with just a microphone. And so what happens is you no longer have the voices raised together, listening to each other, harmonizing, and making a collective performance as it relates to the collective audience. So there's a we consciousness. See, we live in hedonistic, narcissistic, rapaciously individualistic times, and you see it in the music where it's all now more and more about the money as opposed to the music, and the music was about soul stirring. It was not just about body stimulation. Nothing wrong with stimulating your body. James Brown would do that, but James will move your soul, and so will Aretha, and so yeah. will Donny Hathaway, and so will Nina Simone and the others. And that's the tradition the young folk need to be part of. Now, on the other hand, the younger generation, they got Kim Burrell, they got mm -hmm. Jill Scott, they've got Anthony Hamilton and Raheem Devon and some others who move your soul, but they push to the margins. Yeah. They push to the margins. Did you and Harry Belafonte have words with Jay-Z? Oh, we did, we did, we did. We had some wonderful words. And Lupe Fiasco was there as well, as you know. But I mean, Jay-Z is a lyrical genius. It is no, there's no doubt about it. But the question is, uh, we've had geniuses before in black culture. The question is what you're gonna do with it. Yeah. Who you gonna serve? Ferguson, Baltimore, New York, Cleveland, already in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. certainly Florida, go back to Trayvon Martin. What is happening in this country vis-a-vis -vis policing? Are we just seeing things we didn't see before? Or is there really some new level of brutality that's coming out in the streets? Well, one, this marvelous new militancy mm -hmm. among the younger generation. It's multiracial, it's multicultural, led primarily by young black folk, primarily black women, and primarily by black queer women, new phenomena in that sense, but we know every 28 hours has been a black or brown person shot over the last 10 years with not one policeman rendered accountable in the form of going to jail. Right. Black president, black attorney general, black homeland security cabinet member, all those black faces in high places not translating into justice. The rule of law is still deeply racist. But of course, we know how classes it is. Look at Wall Street, all the crimes on Wall Street, the market manipulation, insider trading. Not one Wall Street executive of high order going to jail. They still dominate 
the government up to this day. So that the connection between that rule of law that is deeply racist, deeply tilted toward Wall Street and the well-to-do, and, uh, uh, and then also suspended when it comes to imperial policies, the drones dropping bombs on innocent people. It was a good thing to see the president apologizing for the American life and the Italian life, but when it comes to thousands of lives in Pakistan and Afghanistan and Somalia and Yemen and Libya, 230-some children, innocent children, dead. Not a mumbling word from Mr. President. You see, you see that, that kind of thing burns me up. Well, it does burn you that up, and it's got you up. into a certain amount of trouble in the black community with That's your fine. former mentee, Michael Eric Dyson. Oh, we got to pray for that Negro. Yeah. Dyson absolutely. dedicated 10,000 words in the New Republic recently to taking your, basically, your record apart. He tried to school you in how to criticize Obama in that piece. Exactly. And he talked, your former student, about it's better to say you support the guy, he's up against a lot, he's failing or he has failed on some occasions, than what you do, to which he says that you said, well, that's how we're different. What's wrong with his approach? Well, I mean, he can have the approach he wants. Uh, you know, again, I want everybody to lift their voice, but the question is whether you're going to be honest and candid about it, you see. When I hear talk about Wall Street government, Main Street left out to dry, when I hear talk about a drone presidency and I see the innocent lives lost, when I see massive surveillance that Brother Snowden and, uh, and Sister Manning and others have disclosed, uh, righteous indignation flows. Ecological catastrophe, going to corporate greed, then we got the new Jim Crow, you got decrepit schools and so forth. Then if he says, no, we need polite language in order to support the president and maybe have a criticism every now and then, I say, no, we two different kind of black men. Mm -hmm. I'm full of righteous indignation to see these structural injustices. And I think what we have, and, and Brother Dyson, of course, he's not just a former student. I've known him for over 30 years, but he was my very close brother. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. So when I read, uh, as much as I could read, it was hard to get through the whole thing. It was painful because I could see him in such pain and anguish because we were so close. Mm. You know what I mean? I say, ooh, brother, this looks like a little narcissistic self-projection. You would see in yourself when you're looking at me in terms of you got me wrong. I'm trying to tell the truth and willing to pay a price. You were, to you were telling the truth for a while, and, but unwilling to pay the price. You change, you become one of the president's men, and now you get rationalization for your deference to the status quo. Now, if you want to be, the, you know, deference to the status quo, that's a choice people make. There's mm -hmm. black conservatives, there's black liberals, there's black neoliberals. He wants to be a black leftist. You can't be a leftist and act like a neoliberal. <laughs> you, you, you can't do it. There's something called the truth that's bigger than all of us. So know? it's not about ego that you didn't get the tickets to the inauguration you were looking for? Oh, no. I mean, anytime you do 65 events for somebody within 11 months, you think you deserve a ticket for your mother. I mean, that's just decent for yeah. me. So in that sense, and not only that, but that has nothing to do with drone presidency, Wall Street presidency. Right. These are the issues. And see, I, I was reading my dear brother's piece uh, as we plan to go to Ferguson, Baltimore, and I'm thinking, this is a distraction. You got all these deaths out here, this suffering out here. The last thing we need is some narcissistic discussion about yeah. two Negro intellectuals. So let's move on. We, absolutely. We got the people. <laughs> the, we, we tried to serve the people. Will That's you be right. supporting Bernie Sanders' campaign? Well, I love Brother Bernie. He tells the truth about Wall Street. He really does. I, I, uh, I resonate deeply. With I'm not a Hillary Clinton fan at all, so if he uses his power mm -hmm. to hand it over to, to her, I'll be deeply, deeply upset. But I also think in terms of foreign policy, you see that, um, see on the one hand, we've got escalating anti-Jewish hatred around the world, and we've got to fight anti-Jewish hatred under all conditions. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have a vicious Israeli occupation right. that needs to be highlighted because occupations are wrong. And I don't hear my dear brother Bernie hitting that. And I'm not going to sell my precious Palestinian brothers and sisters down the river only because of U.S. politics. Yeah. The truth cuts over against whatever the political arrangement is. So we got to be able to somehow keep track of anti-Jewish hatred, which is evil, and occupations of whatever sort, in this sense, vicious Israeli occupations, that's evil as well. And I think Bernie might pull back on yeah. some of those issues. Where do you see trans 
discrimination and trans equality in your constellation of justice? I think it's a matter of just trying to be consistent. You know what the great Jane Austen called constancy. Can you be consistent from one context to the next so that you have some sense of integrity? So that, for example, my gay brothers, lesbian sisters, the trans, the cis folk, see, I, I don't want to be an ally. I'm a freedom fighter concerned about the freedom of human beings. They're human beings in that context. I'm with them. Mm -hmm. Same is true with my sisters vis-a-vis -vis patriarchy or working people vis-a-vis -vis capitalist bosses that are uh, exploitative in the wonderful ways in which Richard Wolff yeah. Uh, has talked about this. He's a towering public intellectual along with Chomsky and David Bromwich. And, well, that's uh, the difference between Angela sympathy Davis and empathy, and being in you solidarity be, versus self-identifying. Absolutely. And, and, and what you do, you just, you're there, you show up. Mm. You see, you're there, you show up, and you don't ask for their permission, but you do ask for their consultation so that you're able to be a more effective freedom fighter in their context. But you certain moral consistency in myself as a Christian is really a matter of spirituality mm -hmm. too. Because you see, for me, see, I'm a cross bearer before I'm a flag waver. And the cross Amen. is about unarmed truth and unconditional love. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak no matter who it is. And the love, of course, is about trying to make that contact, that, that contact with people at the psychic existential level as well as justice being what love looks like in public. So it's a matter of trying to bear witness in a public way. So I, in that sense, that's what I love about the best of Marxism. You, internationalists across yeah. the board, yeah. a baby in Ethiopia, same status as a baby in Tel Aviv, same status as a baby in West Bank, same status as a baby in Newtown, Connecticut, or a black baby in Harlem. And that sounds so simplistic, but when you follow internationalism, it can get you in trouble. Because <laughs> nationalism is the most powerful ideology in the modern world, in some sense, in terms of what people are willing to live and die for. I can't let you go without celebrating and looking at the incredible legacy of blues man, B.B. King. Yeah, my God, what a giant, what a giant. B.B. exemplified what the blues is all about. It's person, personal narrative of catastrophe expressed lyrically. <laughs> and when he said, nobody loves me but my mom, it, she might be jiving too. That's a catastrophe. But what does he do in the face of catastrophe? Style, so with a smile compassion, courage. And see, that's the history of a people, because I come from a blues people. What do we do in the face of slavery, Jim Crow, Jane Crow? Smile, style, love, justice, hate it, teach the world something about love, terrorize, teach the world something about freedom. That's Sojourner Truth, the Malcolm X, the Martin King, the Donnie Hathaway, to Aretha Franklin. And it's a great uh, tradition, and B.B. exemplified it at the highest, highest level. I carry around with me this card that Brother B.B. and I used to talk about all the time in the trailer. You see this card? Dear Dr. West, jazz is the big brother of the blues. If a guy's playing blues like we play, it's, we, he's in high school. When he starts playing jazz, it's like going on to school of higher learning. Because mm. he, he always says, oh, you say you a jazz man in the world of the mind. I say, yeah, that's me, brother. I aspire to that. <laughs> and I'm a blues man in, in, in the world of ideas. Well, that's for me is the highest title you can have, much deeper than public intellectual, because when you're a jazz woman or a blues man, you're choosing to be a certain kind of human being in the face of catastrophe, you still smile and have style and ready to fight. Smile, style, love, justice, fight. Cornell right. West, thanks so much for coming in. Thank Great you so much. You. What a blessing to be in conversation with you, my you dear You can sister. get more information about Professor West's work at our website. We're in Baltimore. What are the systemic issues that result in a young man being murdered? We revisit a classic interview with new Jim Crow author Michelle Alexander. Poor people of all colors are being harmed severely by our political and economic policies. But a race wedge is being used to keep them divided and distracted. Just going through the whole justice system is violence. If, you, if you're a single mother and you're a sex worker and you get arrested, who's going to take care of your kids? 
if you decide to leave sex work for any other reason, then you have a charge on your, on your records forever. And so trying to get a job, trying to get to school, trying to get a, a degree, it's pretty hard.